Well, thank, thanks for taking the time to come here, uh, hear, hear this story. I'm going to share uh, the history and then I'll bring you up to speed and sort of talk you and walk through Beam and then I'm going to pass things out that you can see and experience. But, you know, my, 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 my I've been doing, you know, entrepreneurship for over 20 years and my, my greatest satisfaction is actually doing this. I, I, despite everything that I've done or haven't done, really coming and talking to uh, young entrepreneurs in the making or entrepreneurs who are creating stuff. For me, that's my greatest pleasure. So it's a real honor to be here. So thank you for, for allowing me to come and, and share with you. Um, just very quickly, went to Babson, studied entrepreneurship. Uh, I, I loved it. I'm a huge fan of, of the college. Um, when I got out of school, when I was at Babson, I invented a product. And uh, when I graduated, I, I didn't follow up on that. And then some years later, after being uh, kicked out of a number of companies, because I, 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 my first jobs were uh, working in real estate development and uh, I was doing things sort of my own way and my bosses kept coming in and saying, hey, <laughs> I, I just can't, you know, you gotta follow the rules, you gotta do the way that we're supposed to do it. But I, I had a hard time doing that because I always had my own ideas. And, and finally my last boss sat me down and said, Andrew, I really like you, but you know, you're not gonna ever be satisfied until you're doing your own thing as your own boss. And, and he, he was really right and, I, and he, he, that was right. So. After that, after that last episode, I'm like, okay, I got, I got to do my own thing. So I, I, uh, I went back and picked up that invention that I created at Babson, and, and it was now seven years later. And when I invented it, there was nothing like it. Seven years later, the whole industry had been built up around it. And, and just quickly, what it was, uh, at, in those days, there was no way to carry your toiletries to the shower and, and, and bathroom. So I thought, well. Let's take a six pack of beer, turn it into a plastic holder, <laughs> put your shampoos and toothpaste and stuff, and we'll license the names, and, and you can put you know college names or football teams or, or drinks or Budweiser on there. So we kind of hit on all the right things. Well, I didn't follow up seven years later. I was in LA, went to the UCLA bookstore, and, and there were three shelves full of all different kinds of shower caddies and bath totes, and so it had happened. Um, so that was not great for me, but it was, it was, it was valuable. And, and the one thing that I try to always take away from everything that happens is, you know, what can, what's, what's the silver lining? What can I learn here? So I was very disappointed that it already had happened, but I was like, okay, what's the silver lining? Okay, your instincts, trust your instincts. You, you had a good instinct that was right. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna trust my instincts. I don't know what I'm gonna do with my life. I was living on a friend's couch. I was in my late twenties and I was like, oh man, I gotta, I gotta figure this out. I went to Babs and I thought I was gonna do something with my life. You know, I'm, I'm like, you know, I was, I think I was making some money being a busboy at the time in a restaurant and I was like, I have all this education, what am I gonna do? So I was at a friend's house and right before I went over there, I laid out, a, a, I always like to start with a high level, what's important to me. If I was gonna create something without knowing what it is, what is important to me about this journey? What is it that I wanna do without knowing what it is that I'm going to do? And I thought, I want to invent something that's helpful to people. That's all I knew. I want to do something that's helpful to people, something that I can get my hands around and actually do it myself. So a couple weeks later at a friend's house and my friends hadn't had any kids yet. I didn't know what a, I didn't know what a baby was. I was probably afraid of babies. I had no idea what a baby was. I was a single guy trying to figure out my own life. Babies was not on my radar at the time. But I was at a friend's house and her older sister, was breastfeeding her baby, and I just happened to be there by chance, and she was just talking out loud about how all of her girlfriends were nursing their babies and uncomfortable, having a hard time. It was really challenging. It was, it was painful, it was challenging, and it wasn't as obvious and natural as one would think. And she said, God, if somebody could invent something to make this more comfortable, every woman would benefit from it. And, and it was like, a lightning you know, rod went off my head and I was like, really? And I started asking questions and sure enough, the next few weeks I just started going to baby stores, trying to learn about baby <laughs> products and, and trying to find new moms who were breastfeeding their babies to ask them about their experience. So it's, it's a whole nother story for another time, but the short version is I got convinced there was a need. I, I started dreaming up based on all the products that were out there, how could I make a better version of what, what was needed? 
I started dreaming up. I looked at everything that was out there and saw all the issues with it and learned about the issues. I said, okay, how can I create something that solves all those issues? And I slowly got this vision for this breastfeeding support pillow that moms would wear when they're nursing their babies. Of course, I came home from LA back to San Francisco and told my family, okay, I know what I'm gonna do with my life. I'm gonna invent the world's best breastfeeding support. You know, my sister and my mom are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you don't even know where baby is. So, um, but, but I had the conviction and I had the vision and, and that was it. So I, I took off to the races with my idea about what the next, you know, couple of years would be like. And the next many years had their own, you know, colorful history to how the, the business unfolded. But uh, I did create this product. It did become the world's best breastfeeding support. It was a very challenging journey. I had to go through a lot of, you know, hard knocks and challenges and ups and downs. I didn't know if I was going to make it. It was definitely not, you know, some overnight success at all. I worked really hard. The one takeaway that I remember when I was building this was people said, the big companies are going to just knock you off and put you out of business. You'll never make it. You're just a little guy creating something. There's all these big companies out there that are massive organizations and they're just going to knock you off and you'll be out of business. I remember, you know, especially family members who, you know, were casting doubt, you know, that's sometimes family members are, are great at that. So <laughs> I, uh, I was really nervous about that, but I can just tell you that 22 years later, lots of companies, 50 companies have tried to come out and, and, and take over this market share that I've created and they haven't. And I'm still the best in this category. I created a new category and that, idea of the big companies going to knock you off and put you out of it, 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 it just never happened. And, and I think one big takeaway from that experience is fear is always going to present itself in your mind while you're doing something. You the fear, but whether it's a parent, a friend, a business person, it's always going to come up like, hey, you got to be fearful about these things. Well, I can say one thing about this journey is don't spend your time focusing on fear or worrying about what other people say. Just focus on what's in your mind, your conviction, your heart about your vision. Great to be open, great to be nimble and, and hear and see what, what could be supportive, but keep going after your vision and be willing to be flexible and, and, and adjust. But, but don't let fear stop you from creating something or going after something that you really care about. A couple years later, I invented this new type of retail business. Um, that I wanted to do for moms and babies because now I was in that world and I built this retail chain here in the Bay Area and, and I sold that and got out of that business uh, in 2010. But it was a whole new concept, it was a new idea about how to support parents and babies in one location with everything they need. And my first center was on a second floor space. And, and again, people said, you're crazy, you can't put a retail business on a second floor, you gotta have, you know. You can't do that, it's never gonna work. But I did do that, and what I did was I got relationships with the hospitals and they would drive traffic there, and there was such a need that it, those things work. So again, if I had followed the fear and listened to sort of practical reasoning, I, I would have never done it. So a uh, similar lesson on, on, on another long story for another time. Greatest venture, got married, had three little kids. Finally, after helping all these moms and babies over all these years, I finally like pulled off that venture, which is by far the hardest and the most rewarding. Um, when, the, when the time is right, it's a, it's a great experience. And then I thought, okay, uh, my next venture, I, I grew up out here in, in, in Silicon Valley. I grew up down in Palo Alto, went to Babson, and I never, I was like the least technological person on the planet. I watched, technology happened growing up here in Silicon Valley, but it wasn't something that I was particularly drawn to. And I was, you know, a little bit old school, like doing things, you know, the old, the old fashioned way. So I thought to myself, you know what? I know nothing about technology. I'm gonna try my hand in technology because I'm gonna try to, I, I was convinced that I'm gonna use the same principles of what I've always been able to do, which is see me come up with a solution and, and, and just go for it, don't stop until, until, until I make it happen. So. What I didn't realize was how hard what I was about to do is gonna do. The beauty of not knowing is that you just take it one day at a time and you keep going and it's like climbing you know, Mount Everest with a blindfold on. You just take one step at a time and you, and you keep trusting and learning as you go. So uh, this is me and um, when I started, I'm gonna take you through a little bit of an evolution just so you can kind of see how not only is it critical to have like your you know, conviction and go for stuff and have your vision, but it's really important to stay open 
to receiving feedback and being able to, to move and pivot to be nimble. Really important. It has been for me. So when I started, I thought to myself, just like I approach all these ventures, what is it that I want to do? And I'm like, I want to do something in technology. I know nothing about it. Um, I want to do something that could help society. I want to do something where I can use technology to really help society do something in a meaningful way. I'm like, okay, what do I care about? Well, I care about causes. I care about values. I care about giving people a voice. I'm like, okay, so I want to do something in technology, give people a voice around causes and support things that, you know, around values. Okay, that's all I knew. And then what I had remembered that many years ago, because I'm always thinking of ideas and stuff, I had remembered thinking about this idea, which was, think about the baseball cap. Think about the baseball cap. You got a baseball cap on. Usually there's something on it or not, but if there's something on it, it's, it's a patch. So you, so you live your whole life with this one patch on this one baseball cap. So I started thinking, what about a baseball cap that had interchangeable parts? A little bit like when the Swatch Watch happened, you could change bands and things. So I started thinking, what about if I came up with a modular baseball cap and then sold separate parts? So I'm going to a Yankees game, I can put this in, I'm going to a you know, 49er game, I can put that on. <laughs> Not to be a traitor, but anything I want, my university or things that I care about or fashion statements or values. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna reinvent this whole baseball hat concept with changeable parts where you can put your values on and wear things that you care about, and then you can have a whole collection of cool things that you can put on your baseball cap. And based on your day and your mood, you put on whatever it is. And so I called this Karma Caps, because I thought, you know what? I'm gonna create this new kind of cap called the Karma Cap. You create your own karma. You wear this hat, you put the stuff that you want in your life, that you care about, and you want the world to know about, and you're gonna manifest it. So that, that's 15 years ago when it came into my head. I was busy building my other business, so I didn't have time, but I kind of just put it on and wrote it around and put it down. I actually trademarked the name Karma Cap. Now, flash to 15 years later, I'm like, okay, I want to do something in technology. So that flashed on me, and I thought, technology has totally changed now. This, this, this is before there were screens and displays. So I'm like, okay, what about a baseball cap with a display on it, with a screen on it? So now it's a digital version of what I've been thinking about. So, and I'm like, and then how about if I tie it into all these, you know, causes and philanthropies, and now I can wear and share the things that I care about and do it with you know, a way to donate and, and build causes. So I had this very altruistic idea, which was I'm gonna use technology to connect people in the real world. Because I thought there was so much infrastructure going into connecting all of us online, but what's happening to the face-to-face? -face? If we just keep getting connected online, but we lose the connection as one human to another, I, I'm not so sure that's good for society in the long run. So I thought, let me create technology that connects us in the real world so that we keep talking to each other. Walking down the street, I like what you have in your hat, or tell me about that, let me learn from you. So my whole premise was connecting people in the real world. So this is what I originally started it was, it was about create and express what you care about through fashion and dynamic platform for positive change. So I was gonna come up with these self-expression products and use it in a, in a digital way. I'm gonna go through this quickly because I'm about to cover, but, um, the whole idea was that you know people wear baseball caps and now there's ways to bring that into the you know bumper stickers t-shirts and now we can do sort of dynamic versions of this through technology and i was showing that everybody's wearing causes and t-shirts and it's all out there let's digitize this and give people a real platform to to wear and share what they care about this is the future by the way this is my deck three and a half years ago when i started this venture okay and i'm going to show you the deck now or what happened but just to give you this is where i was three and a half years ago so it was, it was, you know, be the change on your karma cap. It was digital bumper stickers and bands that could change. And it was all connected to this platform where you could donate and you'd get the imagery and you'd share it. You could put it on social media. Very big vision, very altruistic about how I was going to do my part to bring people together. And, uh, um, you know, how, how, the, how the whole platform would work and, uh, you know, Wearing, sharing online, sharing the real world, connecting people, telling what you care about. And my whole plan was getting sports events, you know, getting Beyonce and Jay-Z behind the causes they care about, get them wearing a, a karma cap, and, and go after the folks that could really get this out there. So I had all kinds of ideas. You know, so this is June 14th, so this is five years ago, actually, when, when almost five years ago when I was first like brainstorming for this deck. And uh, so here's the initial thing I'm gonna, 
do some funding myself and I'm gonna put patents together, start building product, then I'm gonna go out and get my teams together and, and, and build demos and then and get funded and, and get some VCs on board. And I figured, okay, the thing that I didn't do with my last venture was I never started with a team. I started with myself and I sort of, you know, struggled along and slowly got a team to them. So I thought, okay, I'm an experienced entrepreneur. I'm gonna get a great team, get a great demo, get a great app together. And if I show up in front of VCs with, you know, I've got 20 years of experience. I've got a, a, a team of five very experienced people like me. I've got, here's a demo of the whole, how the whole app looks. Here's the actual product. There's nothing to do except fund us and, and we're gonna roll it out. So that was the plan. It didn't work out that way. No. <laughs> I'll tell you what, at all. <laughs> so, so, so that was the plan, okay? So uh, I, I raised some money based on my deck and everything. I got some people, okay, this guy Andrew, he's motivated, he, you know, we, we, we like his vision, okay, go for it. And I got a lot of people who were very philanthropically oriented, so they liked the spirit of what I was going for. Spent a year and a half developing the technology when I got into trying, so first of all, I was getting into developing hardware, you know, you know, developing electronics. So from a guy who was using a Rolodex, trying to figure out how to develop electronics, it was, it was a great, a great uh, learning curve. But when I got into trying to build this baseball cap with all of this, it, it was so complicated and so, the, the technology was not there to make it actually reasonable at this time. But I did, what I did come up with, okay, can't do the cap, can't do the band because of power, but I'm gonna come up with an idea of like a versatile button. I'm like, your buttons, buttons in the 60s and the 80s, it's all about self-expression. So I'm gonna come up with a button that you can wear, and then from your app, send stuff through Bluetooth on your button and simultaneously share it on social media. That was the vision. After a year and a half, raised a couple million dollars, developed the, the first button, which was a little bigger and thicker, built a, an incredible app that sent stuff through Bluetooth, got causes involved. I, I, and, then, and then I spent a lot of time putting like, this like dream team together. So I, I hired all these people. So I had five of us on the team with a great product and a great app. I'm like, okay, there's nothing left to do except go meet with those VCs, get that money and, and build this thing out. So, so that was the plan. I figured it was definitely gonna work and met with the first VC. Hey Andrew, really interesting, really cool, but you know, you, you, you need a better demo. Okay, wrong VC, I'll go to the next one. Hey, Andrew, really great idea. I've never seen anything like this, but uh, you really need to generate some revenue. Hey, anyway, long story short, I went and met with 65 VCs in 90 days. And each one is a you know an hour presentation and getting grilled by everybody. So 65 VCs said no to me after I had hired this team and paying salaries with five people full time had spent all this money building the demo because six months earlier I met with some VCs that said, love it, come back with a demo that works and an app that works in a team and, and this is great. So I did what they said, I came back with everything and I got shot down 65 times from 65 different VCs. Now I had to let go of everybody. I couldn't afford to keep everybody on. So after spending all this time getting my team together and building these demos, that wasn't gonna suffice. Well, the market had changed a little bit. So all of a sudden, hardware wasn't as quite as, you know, Fitbit had come out and they were having problems. Also, okay, what am I gonna do? Well, let me figure out what the issues are and what I need to do. I'm like, okay, I need to figure out how to get this to market. I have to figure out how to get this product into the market because once I get it to the market, there's no, you can't deny it. It's, it's out there, it's, people love it, it's selling. I gotta get this to the market. So how am I gonna do that? I'm out of capital. But the, okay, I'll do what, I, what I've been good at. I'm gonna go back to angel investors, some who are already in the round and find some of them and say, look, this is what we've done. This is what we've learned. We've gotta get this to the market. And once it's in the, the market, it's undeniable. So I spent a whole nother year, year and a half, raising capital, retooling the whole product from a much bigger device to smaller, redoing the whole app and figuring out how to get this to market. I was, I'm like, that's my only will get this to the market at all costs. So a year and a half of my time, full out energy at this pace that I'm speaking to you the whole time. And finally, <laughs> da, 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 we, 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 we manufactured the products, we built the packaging, 
it, it, it's wear and share what you care about on your digital button called the Beam. Uh, you know, we, we built beautiful packaging, beautiful product, different ways that you can wear it. We've, I've got, you know, charities on board. I, I've got all the things I'm going, except I spent six months going back and forth to Hollywood trying to get the influencers on board to jump on the Beam team. But I couldn't get any of them on board without paying them a lot of money. As much as they want to support their cause, they, 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 want, they, want, their, they want their money. <laughs> so I, I could not get them on board. And, and, and you know, you might get because I'm a pretty persistent, compelling, you know, like I have a lot of, you know, passion about it. But I tried for every, everybody across, musicians and actors, could get them on board. I'm like, okay, forget them. Let's get this baby out in the market. Let's get people using it. So we launched this in December of 2017. I was so excited and, and I had two of us <clears throat> working full time and about 20 people outsourced. I had teams in the Ukraine, hardware teams in Chicago. I was managing 12 different groups, building all this hardware and building the software, the, the, the mobile app. And then we finally launched it. You know, PR, marketing, this is all happening. First month sales, 70,000. Oh man, to 70,000 the first month, obviously it's gonna to go to 120K the next month. So this year should probably be you know, a million, you know, great. These are my ideas, right? First month, 70K. Second month, 45K. Third month, 30K. So now it's February and our sales are going like this. I'm like, wait a minute. That's not what's supposed to happen. This is supposed to keep going up. We're doing everything right. <laughs> well, what happened and what I noticed was that our sales were going down, even though people were using it, loved it, people were wearing their things, but I was trying to create a new behavior with this technology. And it's one thing to take an existing behavior and modify it and improve it, but it takes a lot of resources to introduce something new and get people on board, unless you happen to get lucky or have the thing where you could have these major influencers all doing it, I had those ideas, but I didn't have that. So what happened was I couldn't get enough people engaged in buying and wearing beams. I was gonna, you know, try to create this new behavior where we all wear, it's like wearing, you know, this visual LinkedIn or wearing your Instagram or wearing, you know, whatever it is that you wanna wear a shirt. So I couldn't make it happen. And we were running low on capital. What I, so I thought, oh man, this is, it's, it's not working. And working with other charities, as much as I had this great altruistic idea to help the world and help causes, they're not entrepreneurial, most of them in their nature. They're starting to think about that. But it was like working in healthcare, which are like, you know, really hard to move these big dinosaurs of organizations to mobilize them to do new stuff. So I couldn't get it going, despite massive amount of energy and effort. So I'm like, okay, th this is not happening. I can't believe it. What I did notice was that the most purchases on our website of the devices were coming from companies who were buying 10, 20, 30. Like, well, what's going on? So I started calling these companies and like, hey, I'm the CEO of Beam. I'd love to learn. Well, companies started buying these devices and putting it on their sales teams, going to trade shows and conferences because it was an absolute conversation starter and attention seeker. So literally in 90 days after launch, I pivoted the whole company and I thought, you know what? As much as I wanted to make this altruistic, you know, beautiful vision of like helping the world talk to each other and support causes, what I need to do now is follow what's happening. And what was happening was attraction was where these companies were using Beam for their sales teams. So I pivoted the entire company and said, okay, our whole focus is we are going, and there was another, a couple other things that I had learned, which was that trying to like sell hardware for a hundred dollars a unit, sure you could sell it to a consumer if they were on board, but trying to sell hardware to companies at a hundred dollars per their employees, that was a big purchase, that was expensive. So I pivoted the company and said, we are going to become a B2B business where we are going to sell beams to companies for them to wear in any instance where it's consumer facing, retail stores, banks, uh, hotels, anywhere where there's information that you wanna be communicating to your customers, 
they, they, their employees can be wearing me. So during all of last year, I was building the software with these outsourced teams in the Ukraine. It was just myself, my one person I hired, my COO, and then David, who's helping film in the back, he joined us almost a year ago. And the whole year was spent building the software and, and, and me running around in these companies saying, hey, you, you can put things on here that will accomplish some of the things that I was originally thinking about. And some of the companies are, oh wow, that's interesting. I'm like, I'll tell you what, we're building software. You don't even need software right now. Let us load these up with your content, put these on your employees and just wear them for a month. We'll give them to you. So I started getting these companies to wear their beams, put them on their employees and, 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 and try it out. So all of last year was piloting the platform without the software because I didn't have any way for them to control it. So we were, you know, loading it up, sending it to them, putting it on, getting it back, changing it for them. The whole year was built building software, getting companies to start trying this new thing. So after the entire year of a bunch of companies trying it and having great results, our software was finally finished this year in January. We just launched it. And we uh, and I'll go through this really quick, but so so I'm actually raising a new round right now based on a, a SaaS or a SaaS business that happens to come with hardware. It, it just it's included in the price of the SaaS. And now all these companies that were like, oh, we don't buy hardware, it's too expensive. Oh, you have SaaS? Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll license SaaS. This is great, recurring revenue. Every month. That's what they're used to, that's great for us, that's great for them. So the whole thing about pivoting into a SaaS was, was, was necessary. And the, the premise is still the same, connecting people in the real world. The other thing that we did was, I convinced these companies to put information on here about the employee. Because all companies that are consumer facing, from fast food to retail, they're all struggling against Amazon because Amazon's online and they don't have the overhead of, of, of real estate. So all of these companies are trying to figure out how to have a more meaningful customer experience in store. So I'm like, here's one way to do it. Have your employees put on here their name, where they're from, something that they're passionate about, whether a football team, a picture of their kids. Engage the customer from a human to human experience and then talk about what you're selling. So these companies have done that. Well, the first thing is the employees love it. Like we're working with Safeway, for example. You're, 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 you're a cashier at Safeway or banking groceries at Safeway. You're a number in a very big organization. But all of a sudden to be able to be asked what you care about and where that picture of your kids or your dog or you like hiking or you're from New York or whatever it is, these employees lit up. They loved it. And the company's like, oh wow, our employees feel empowered and validated. So this became our model, which is, Beam is about learning and sharing things about your employees, about connecting with customers, informing them about your corporate initiatives. And this is this is the future of, you know, with the original name tag, which, which was about connecting people. So this is, so we've launched, we've just actually rolled out our first SaaS company, um, a guy named Ron Johnson who worked with Steve Jobs to build the Apple store. He has a delivery company, some of you might know it, Enjoy. If you order like a Sonos or some technology, they come to your house and they, they deliver your equipment. And it's a really, it's like the Apple Genius Bar comes to your house and it's free to you. So anyway, say, I, I met with Ron, he loved it. He tried it on his delivery team. They loved it, the customers loved it. And so after a year of testing it, they just rolled it out with our SaaS. So he was our first corporate rollout. But, let me just show you, remember that first deck. Let me show you, here's the deck that I'm actually running around now, raising money with VCs. We have, we have revenue, we have you know, corporate traction. I, I'm not convinced that the VCs are gonna fund this, but it doesn't matter, we'll figure it out. So, <laughs> so um, basically the concept was everybody's busy with their screens. Uh, how do you engage more in the real world? Well, use the screen to connect. So wear and share, and, and it does all the things. It informs, it engages, it connects, uh, it, it, it empowers the employee. It, it's a powerful experience uh, in, in the in-store experience. And you know, it shows how the SaaS works, you create content, you can disperse it on these auto-published calendars and it shows up and, and your employees are wearing it happily. By the way, just discover this becomes a great advertising platform. So you're, in, you're a Safeway and also you've got all these you know, CPG companies, guess where they wanna to pay to be? on all your cashiers when, when your customers are checking out. So we're now morphing into an advertising platform as well. So these are examples of possibilities. I have Pete's Coffee, Beaming, I uh, just met with Starbucks, um, whether it's retail, hotel, and uh, these are just all the things that 
or the impact of using our platform from the customer to the employee to the company as well. Um, so Albertsons is using it. I just met with the CEO of Albertsons. We're now talking about rolling out to 300 stores. Ron Johnson, uh, Round Table Pizza started with four. They rolled it up to 20. Miami Heat used it in their stadiums. So the first line are all active pilots that we have going now. Uh, you know, Comcast has just launched, Rogers up in Canada, uh, Shoe Chain. And then these are all the ones that we're now in conversations with in planning pilots. And, uh, and then these are the ones that we've met with. And these are just some of the like, old RIP. Um, there's nobody doing what we're doing. There's a couple little upstarts, one in France, one in Sweden, but it's not a platform, it's just sort of like a fun yard. So, by the way, the team still, myself, Jonathan, and, and David in the back, we have so many outsourced people working with us so that we can turn them on and off as we need them. But typically when you launch a hardware company uh, with software, there's 25 people on the team by now. So it, it's a major, a major undertaking. But Foxconn, who does all of Apple's products, I was able to convince them that this is the future of an important piece of technology. They, they, they've taken a gamble with me when I when I launched this, you know, over you know a year and a half ago, and and and, and now I have to keep them on board. And say, hey, I know if things slow down for that year, or we were you know truly, but guess what? We got a much bigger opportunity. This, this has been really important because it, I can you know I can talk to people and say our product is the highest quality on the planet. It's Apple, so that was really important uh, partnership. Um, we've got some great name investors who care about uh, what we're up to. So, you know, what are the big takeaways? One is don't let fear get in the way. Number two is stay, I want to pass this around in a minute, stay, stay open and, and nimble. I've constantly had to pivot, adjust, rethink. So as determined as I've been and as clear as my vision, my vision has clearly changed, but in some ways it hasn't. The whole thing was use technology to connect people. I'm now connecting people, but it's in a, it's in a business environment. But that wasn't where I started. So the, the, the essence of it is there. But I had to stay open, I had to receive feedback, and I had to be willing to retranche, go back, you know, start again. Yes, if you pick things that you are, that you learn something about, or you know, you work in an industry and, 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 and branch off from something, you know, you follow that. But at the end of the day, even if you don't know anything about it, you can still dream up something. And there is something beautiful about not knowing about what you're doing at all, but not knowing anything about it. You have, you have a very open mind to dreaming up something that everybody you know, kind of gets into silos of how they think about things. But when you know nothing about it, you can think really outside the box. And I would say that's what I've done in all these cases. And so don't, don't let anything limit you. Um, you're, you're the only limitation, right? Your own ideas. Don't let fear get in the way. Be open and nimble. Be willing to adjust and change. Take feedback, take criticism, find out where's the value in it, and, and, and just keep going, and, and you'll deliver something to the market that'll be really special, whatever your vision is. So I'm gonna pass these around, but thanks, thanks a lot, open for questions. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that uh, company for using interfaces, do you still do that, or is it mostly now it's just um, like, com like in store and sharing? Um, so, uh, we still do trade shows and conferences. We haven't figured out. Um, we haven't figured out how to uh, use our platform in a, in a conference trade show environment. Um, so companies use them, but we ha we haven't actually started pursuing the actual organizers of trade shows and conferences. They, they love it, but we haven't. Yeah. So I'm going to tie it to something that I've joked about for years. Yeah. I always say this is my best invention. I just don't know how to make it work. And it connects to what you're doing. It's much smaller. I said, I think we should give everybody a bandana with their name on it. So when you're at a conference, you can look people in the eye and see their name. You make a variation. It's the karma cap, but with the name. That's for conferences. Yeah. Give them out to uh, conference organizers. Everybody has their name and one message that you can change to. Absolutely. And do it at two conferences, and you'll you'll have. A million fans. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, that's the premise. That is it. Free to the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, first off, thank you so much for coming, sharing, giving your time to us. I think it was a it's an amazing presentation. Great to, to talk to an entrepreneur who's 
really doing something out there. Thank you. Um, for, I also love the packaging. I think that's, that's something that stands out. Uh, so you mentioned that you came from not having a technical background yeah. to sort of becoming a project manager for these these 12 different technical people yeah. spread over the world. Right. Did you learn any technical skills to be able to, to talk to them and, and sort of maybe how fluent in those different areas did you or have you become? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So the answer is yes and no, and I'll qualify it. Um, you know, I learned some of the language, not, not coding, I yep. can't code. Um, I, I learned a little bit of the language and I learned the, the, the structure in which mobile apps and software is built and, and how that process happened. So I went from having no idea about any of it to learning how, how, how do you create software, how do you create a mobile app. So I learned how it works. So I can, I, I, I know the process, but no, no, the answer is I really don't, I, I'm not, Technical still, but I, but I understand a little bit of the language and how you build it, and, and I think it's a it's a beautiful thing because, you know, I was able to continue to manage teams without knowing what I was really managing, um, just because I could look at the results and say, okay, this is how it's working, but I want to shift this, and then they'll go back and redo the code. But um, I, I learned a little bit of the language, how to speak the language a little bit, but and the process. But but no, I'm not more technology. You know, same thing with building consumer electronics. You know, I like the manufacturing of these devices, but uh, you know, I, I couldn't tell you a hundred of the components. And you know, I, so I, I can manage it, make it, make it happen. But no, I, I still don't know much. Uh, so I know you graduated a long time ago, and yeah. uh, you must learn lots of skills along the way of your entrepreneurial uh, experience. But what is one of the most important skills you feel you learned from Madison? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I would say the most important, I studied entrepreneurship at Babson and Marketing, and um, it, it gave me a framework about understanding, the two, two things. One, a framework about how does business work, how does a business work, and how does a business within an industry, what's the relationship? But really the different components of a business and the relationship between you know, marketing and sales and just all, 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 all the relationships of how the mechanics of, a, of an enterprise works. Number two is I, I did you know write business plan and at Babson and I had to present and, and compete and stuff. So uh, it certainly helped me think about structuring a business plan. Um, and then I think the third thing was I was at Babson in, in, in Boston. For me, uh, I made a lot of great relationships, especially we have such a strong international student body, and I was really drawn to the international student body. And I built incredible relationships that are lifelong relationships from people all over the world. That was, you know, probably the most valuable part on a personal level of friends and also just connection and stuff. So people connections and then understanding the nature of how, how an enterprise works. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Doc, thanks so much for coming. Um, so I have two questions that like kind of address the different stages that you were at. So for your first business, uh, when, when you didn't have a pocket reputation, it's like a successful exit, and uh, you weren't necessarily in the demographic that you were targeting, yeah. and like you didn't have those connections. What was like your your first few phases of your business like, and what was your go to market like? Yeah, great, nice, nice question. Thank you. So, so uh, my, my premise was um, a friend of mine from Babson was getting married, and, and, and he wanted me to come to his wedding. I was living in San Francisco. This is going to tie into the answer. I was living in San Francisco. <laughs> He was getting married in New York. I couldn't afford to fly to New York. I was, you know, starving. And uh, he's like, I really want you to come to my wedding. My, my wife, my fiance, and I got to pay for your ticket to come to the wedding. Well, I knew some of my buddies from Babson were going to be at that wedding. And there was, Friday night was a bachelor party. Saturday was the wedding. It was a very fast moving event. <laughs> so after the bachelor party on Friday night, I got four friends who had known me at Babson, knew that I'm pretty, you know, I have a lot of conviction. And I sat them in a room and I said, guys, this is what breastfeeding is about. This is what's on the market. I'm gonna invent something that's better and I need to raise $12,000. I need 3,000 from each of you. And if you invest the three, I'm gonna invent a prototype 
and then you can see what the product is going to be. But that's what I need. So my first day, and they were like, hey, they were drawing, hey, great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, they did, it took me about 60 days to collect, but, but three of the four came through. So, so the plan was, my plan was first build a prototype and, and get enough money together to build a prototype so I have something visual that sort of unlocks the mystery of what I'm talking about. So that was phase one, build a prototype. Something that people can see and touch, even if it's, you know, very sparse, but something that people can get their hands around and see and understand. And, 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 and then phase two was, um, uh, I'm just trying to remember. So phase one was a prototype, and then, and then phase two was taking the prototype to sort of the next level and figuring out some manufacturing for that prototype. How, how am I gonna, how am I gonna mass produce it? I mean, I've got lots of stories about that as baby steps, but prototype and how to mass produce that prototype, but you're gonna have to finesse the prototype into the actual thing, that'll take time. Well, while that's going on, then it's about understanding the market, going out to the market and figuring out where you're gonna sell it and, and, and going and talking to whoever you're gonna sell it to and start entering, hey, here's my prototype, this is what's coming. Um, I, 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 my first trade show for baby products, I went to this prototype, so I didn't even have, a, I, I wasn't even manufacturing, but I ran around and got these reps come back to my hotel room, show them the prototype and say, this is the future of breastfeeding. These products are gonna happen. So I think if you can get something visual that people can touch and feel, uh, use, explore, and then also try to start thinking about sales and marketing while you're figuring out the manufacturing sort of simultaneously. That those are sort of the, the wings that come to mind. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so second question. Yeah. Uh, so now that you've built Beam and then now it's distributed through a lot of companies, like employees are using it, and working uh, how do you quantify the value of like the, the pictures and the interactions and what the fact it has on the company itself by the way that is actually like the smartest question um, and, and the reason why I say that is because all the companies are working with are asking that question yeah. so you, you have honed in on exactly the right thing and it's something that I'm actually trying to figure out because what, what I what I've what, what I've said so far is the impact right now is, is qualitative and you have to care about the in-store experience enough to, to want to invest in this type of experience. How do you quantify that ROI? Yeah. You know, how, do you, how do you quantify that ROI? And so if, this is a little bit philosophical, but it, most companies, if you go into like manage, talking to managers and stuff, they're gonna to wanna to talk about you know, what's the ROI, how much do we put in and what are we getting out? What's the bump on sales? That's sort of a typical place to focus, and they need to know that. But what I try to do is get them into a different paradigm of thinking about what success could look like. If you're in their world of what success is, it's gonna be a hard sell, especially with like Beam in this situation, because I can't tell you right now how much it's gonna drive your sales yet. We don't know, we don't have enough time, and time will figure that out too. I try to move them into a different paradigm of what success could mean. Like think about, if you think about like Weight Watchers, if Weight Watchers said, the only measure of success is losing weight. Everybody comes in looking at the scale. Did it work? If that's the one thing that's success, did I lose weight? Did I lose weight? If it didn't, if your scale didn't change, you're having an unsuccessful experience. But, but maybe there's other things that could qualify success, like somebody's attitude about how they're feeling about themselves, or uh, meeting a friend who's having a shared experience. So, what I try to do is get these companies thinking about a different paradigm of how, how you measure success. So I've actually provided them like, here's how we think about success. Yes, revenue and bumps is important to make come, but here are other things that are qualitative that I don't know that you could put a price on right now. Let's go in there. So I'm working in that area and, and I'm inching them along that way. To that point, like an Albertsons that we're working with, you know, a grocery business operates on, you know, if it's going really well, 3% margin, but probably more like two. So they don't have a lot of margin to be playing around with stuff, even though it's a big company. So um, what I'm doing there is I'm actually now talking to a third party that wants to get into Albertsons and have presence there. So DoorDash is working to be the delivery of Albertsons food. So I'm now meeting with DoorDash and saying, hey, we'll, DoorDash, you pay for the Beam platform. You'll be on the, the platform in Albertsons and Albertson's like, sure, if DoorDash pays for the whole platform, we'll roll it out to the entire company. So I'm, so 
if the ROI isn't clear, are there other ways to help offset the expense? And that's, so that, that's another angle that I'm working on. Great and, question. Andrew, somebody for you to get in touch with is um, uh, Bob Weissman's son. Um, that which, which uh, what's his first name? I'll, I'll, I'll think of it. He's selling to supermarkets something that goes on site that il does illustrations of products with their online sales. But he's got a lot of insight into what moves supermarkets to action. Okay. He's yeah. a Babson alum. I remember. A real interesting guy. Okay. Get in touch with him. He okay. might be an interesting partner for you. That sounds great. I will. I'll follow up with you. That's yeah. great. Thanks. Yeah. That, yeah. Follow up on the uh, find the value question. So yeah. why did you decide to kind of price the software in the, with the additional cost of hardware? Yeah, great. Another good question. These are all, you guys ask, you're all going to ask great questions. It's really good because these are all the things that I'm thinking about all the time. So, nice um, so talking to other people in SaaS. And then, and, then I, and, then, and then a little bit of just sort of my own engineering, like, okay, we need to create a bigger margin. We need to, you know, and it, it was a little bit of sort of backing into how much margin we need to create and how do we do this. And so it was a combination of getting outside, you know, experience and then also back into like what could seem reasonable and then testing it. Yeah. You mentioned you were in Safeway and a couple of other brands, but uh, what, what's been your strategy on piloting with these uh, brands? How did you approach them? How did you meet with them? Great question. So, so I found uh, some trade shows and, and conferences within the industries, and uh, we, we do three a year. We've gone to three this past year, and, and I got to have uh, meetings with decision makers from each of those companies. So, so really, most of it came from trade shows. Um, like Ron Johnson happened to come through somebody that I was knew that knew him that connected me. So networking and going to trade shows and. The most important thing that I've learned about trade shows, despite doing them for 20 years, is that if you get a good meeting, when you're with that person, set up on a calendar right there when your next call is. Because I met with like 50 people face to face who were so gung ho last September, I'm still chasing 45 of them around trying to get that next call, you know, months later. So you ever go to a trade show, when you get that meeting right there, set up that next phone call and get you guys locked in, it'll save you a lot of time. How long was your uh, manufacturing life cycle from when you like began to when to like when you're actually in the market? Yeah, it's it's an unbelievable journey. Uh, manufacturing consumer electronics, un unreal. So w w when you start, you go through these three. This may be telling you things you knew. Uh, no, no. I, okay, okay. I, I had no idea, but I, I learned. So when you when you start manufacturing consumer electronics, you go through these different test cycles, so that each of the different systems. Get, get approved and signed off and you catch things. EBT, DBT, and PBT, and each one is testing, you know, whether it's mechanics or electronics and the different systems. So you run a whole bunch for, so the, the answer is it took about, let's see, we did, uh, outside of funding that delayed us on some stuff, if funding wasn't uh, an issue and you just had to capitalize it for the whole time, it would take about, Let's see, we started EBT in September, and we'll probably be done by June, April to June. So you're looking at like six to nine months. You know, a year, not, not, I'd say not, if you're betting on something, nine months to a year. Six months is really, really quick if you get lucky. Six months is really, really fast, fast, depending on how complicated the, the, the electronics is, but I, I, w I, would, I would plan for nine and, and maybe count on a year, but nine months, I'd say nine months is something you can do. Um, what are the key things you look for when you bring in new hires or when you bring in people or build a team? Um, that guy right there. <laughs> um, David was our, our first hire after my COO that I hired. Um, so it depends on what the hire is, uh, but uh, willing, willingness to just do whatever is required at all times of day or night, like um, just a willingness to really work and, and be available and uh, no ego. Um, uh, to me, the first two things are a willingness to really work, uh, a passion, and no ego. And, and, then, and then from there, of course, there'll be the expertise depending on what the hiring is for. Um, so depending on you know, we're going to bring in you know, front-end software developers, and obviously we need, we need that experience. But yeah, 
passion, no ego, and willingness to work.